A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer, host of The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with Megan Gluth Bohan. Meg is the owner and CEO of TR International, which is a US-based chemical distributor headquartered in Seattle, Washington. Meg is an energetic and creative leader and one that actually has a pretty unique story and background as it relates to the chemical distribution business, right? So Meg is an attorney by training. She um, brings that attorney background and her Midwestern values and, and mindset to um, chemical distribution. So we're going to be talking about that and other things. Um, and I hope you all enjoy this episode. So Meg, welcome to the chemical show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. I'm delighted to have you. So Meg, let's just keep it simple. Tell us a little bit about TRI. Great. TRI is a company that was founded in 1994 by my former business partner uh, after he left uh, the United States Military Academy at West Point and uh, the professional rugby circuit. Um, and since that time, we've obviously evolved uh, and grown from a company that was started like most new enterprises in the United States in someone's home um, to a company now that uh, does a considerable amount of work across all states in the United States and has a pretty large um, footprint, frankly, across several different industries. We are headquartered out of Seattle, but we have sales offices all over the United States and we represent um, products predominantly from overseas. We represent uh, major product lines from South Korea and from Europe. And our goal is really to provide American manufacturers and American industry with a secondary or tertiary source of supply. The idea being to have supply chain uh, and manufacturing continuity. Cool. Awesome. Well, we will get to some of that because I think um, that's all really relevant in the world that mm -hmm. we're in today. Um, yes. So, so tell us about how you got started in this though. So it's not often that we see, um, women owning distribution companies. Sure. That's one thing. And it's mm -hmm. not often that we see attorneys who are heading up chemical businesses. So yes. how did you venture forth into this wonderful world of chemicals and chemical distribution? I joke that I might be the only um, attorney in this industry that anyone likes. Um, and I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if that's um, earned on either side, but um, yeah, it's a very interesting story. In 2011, I believe it was, um, I was relocating to Seattle and I called a friend of mine um, that I went to law school with. And I said, do you know anyone that practices law in Seattle? I'd like to just get a feel for the legal market. I had been practicing uh, in both Minnesota and Oregon prior to moving to Seattle. Um, and he said, I don't, but I know a guy who probably does. You should go meet him. He runs a chemical distribution company. At that time, I had no idea what chemical distribution was. And it's, um, I still say to this day, it's a hidden industry. I, I think, um, we, we maybe should do better to explain how, how vibrant and amazing this industry is. But uh, the point is I met him and um, his name was Tony Ridnell, founder of TR International, um, TRI. And he and I struck up um, just, uh, I call it just, we're, we're like the odd couple. I mean, even to this day, we're no longer in business together, but we really do have sort of this yin and yang to us. And um, by the time I left the meeting with him, which I thought was going to be to get some referrals and just sort of the lay of the land for who's who in Seattle, um, he had offered me a job a couple of days later to be the company's first general counsel. Awesome. Neither he nor I knew what I would do and whether this was needed. But we did know that it was a highly regulated industry and one that also favors a lot of um, 
contracts and just what I would call compliance oversight. Um, and things really took off, I think, faster than than either of us thought it would. And I really um, grew to love this business. I'm challenged by it. I like it. I, I think every day is I'm always excited to come to work with very rare exception. And um, I think that my excitement for that and the, the skills that I have as an attorney sort of led me to to be useful in several different leadership roles. And then um, sort of it came to this point where I was the CEO of the company and he and I began to discuss what his succession plan was. So first I acquired 55% and I think he and I thought we'd see how that went and it went marvelously. Um, I then a year later acquired the full 100% and he is at this very moment uh, enjoying a a much coveted retirement um, yeah. sitting on his deck, looking out at Lake Washington, which he just so richly deserves. Neat. That's neat. So it's interesting, you know, you, um, it sounds like it was a bit of a leap of faith on mm -hmm. both of your parts. So, I mean, would you, do you consider yourself a risk taker? I mean, is that part of your DNA and profile? If you asked me to describe myself that way, I would not. But the truth is um, I lean very heavily on my gut and intuition. I'm also, I balance that, I think, really well with the pragmatism that comes from um, being an attorney, um, as well as sort of a Midwesterner, we can get to that later, but that sort of yeah. lends itself to that. Being a, an entrepreneur is by definition, I think, being a risk taker. Um, and I think what makes me good is that I can balance that risk with a certain level of um, logic that yeah. where the two sort of balance each other out really, really well. Um, and I think that makes me really effective. But I would not, if you asked me to describe myself, I would not say that. I will say, and I tell people this all the time, I was never really a goal setter. And I am hmm. a person that, that when a door is in front of me, I, I have a moment where I stop and I pause and I consider why it's there. And I tend to walk through it. Yeah. And um, there's a statement, you know, leap and the net will appear. I do that a lot. And I, it, you know, as my life has progressed, I really have a lot of confidence in that net. Um, and, and so in that sense, yeah, I think it's, it's risk taking, but I wouldn't yeah. say that's part of my personality profile at yeah, all. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a different, maybe a different form of risk. And actually the reality yes. is risk taking is measured. We sometimes forget yes. that, right? So when you think about risks, we all take risks every day. Um, we may or may not recognize them, but a lot about risk and let's just say risk-based decisions is also understanding and managing that risk. And Absolutely. so it's, uh, it's a different form of that. So that's awesome. That's really, um, that's actually really interesting. So, you know, if we turn to the business and just think about everything that's gone in the, on in the last 12, 18 months, the COVID pandemic has, um, I think in some ways made and lost fortunes for everybody, depending yeah. on where you yeah. are in the spectrum of life and business, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so what's been the biggest impact of the pandemic on your business? How have you guys um, been able to respond and thrive through this? Well, number one, people first, always. Uh, the first thing we did was to focus on what we needed to do to take care of our people. And I think, um, when the pandemic started, that was um, more difficult than we remember. You know, we, we have the benefit mm -hmm. of time now and, and we don't remember. You, you go back to the beginning. Should we wear masks? What we were all in the same room just days ago and now we're not coming back to the office. What impact does this have on people emotionally and, and all of that? So we we set ourselves um, up to, you know, sort of be committed to taking care of the team first and foremost. But a lot of people, when they say in business, people first, they forget that it's not just your people. It's the people who rely on you. And we noticed mm -hmm. right away that we were going to have a lot of people that rely on us to provide um, goods and services that we needed to figure out how we were going to take care of them. We have always had certain chemistries as part of our, our sales portfolio that are used in hand sanitizer and cleaning supplies, and all of that food and pharmaceuticals. Um, and what happened for us is that almost overnight, those product lines, which before were on sort of this cadence of, you know, predictability skyrocketed. Yeah. 
And um, the good thing about TRI is that we have been a company that for our nearly 30 years has always had logistics experience moving product around the globe. So we were able to be very, very effective in that and just continue to do what we do well and do better. Um, but I, I would be lying if I didn't say I worried, you know what I mean? Mm, Even absolutely. when things were good, it, it, the last 18 to 24 months has been a, a level of uncertainty that I, I, I think most of us in this industry have never, I don't even know how to forecast, you know, and, yeah. and how to move from one month to the next. So it was stressful, but also really rewarding too. Awesome. Awesome. And so where do you see things now? I mean, it's, um, I, I think it's, you know, if I look at the first half of the year and, and it's, uh, and again, it's been uh, different based on different segments and stuff. So the first half of 2020, you know, there was a lot of downturn. Um, there were certain markets, you know, hand sanitizing, cleaning, uh, biocides, disinfectants that were rock, you know, skyrocketing. Second half of 2020 um, seemed to be doing well. The first half of 2021, um, it, depending on where you are in the market, unexpectedly well, unexpected, you know, outages. If I think about things that happened, for instance, in the U.S. Gulf Coast with the freeze, that certainly had a big knock-on effect across a variety of industries. But, you know, how is maybe the first half of 2021 going and what are you seeing ahead for t- the second half of 21? For us, um, the first half of 2021, I, I'm a big um count your blessings kind of lady. I have a daily gratitude practice. And so what I've said about 2021 is that I'm just elated that we're here and we're doing well and we've made it through. Um, But we do, we have certain product segments and certain industry segments that are just thriving. And we are, most of our inventory is sold before it ever reaches the the shore, Mm -hmm. which is atypical. I mean, it used to be that we are a stocking and import based stocking distributor. So it used to be that we had a a pretty healthy inventory reserve from which to offer. And that is different. And so it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. And I think we're not the only people that feel that way. Um, I think across the entire industry, we're seeing people where the demand is there and in, in an ordinary supply cycle, you'd be so excited to see this level of business, but the the tricky part is making sure that you actually have something there to sell. So I think we're doing really well, all things considered. I, we've leaned really hard on some really um, longstanding relationships, both on the supply side and on the logistics side. Uh, and we have a lot of collective experience in our company to sort of handle that, but I couldn't forecast necessarily going forward. I, I like everyone else, mm-hmm. I'm sure that you've talked to, I am wondering what the future brings in terms of some of the prices, particularly of commodities. And, um, and I, I have a hard time understanding what the actual supply picture is at a, at a root level. And so it's a little bit harder to predict. And so I have taken special care just as a, it's a personal thing, um, to not really, um, I, I'm not trying to make life decisions on this moment and, and long-term decisions on this moment. Yeah, I think that's wise. I've actually been talking to a number of people recently about this very thing, right? That um, business is strong, but yeah. but what's underneath it? Is it built exactly. on a foundation of salt? Is it built on a foundation of rock? What's it built on? Yeah. And there's a lot of uncertainty um, with that. And, you know, and there's, there's ways to maybe manage it. Um, and it's, you know, risk-based and it's maybe scenario based, right? So really yeah. thinking about what, what is the, what are those future scenarios and how are you going to respond? But it's, yes. Yeah. We're living in a period of uncertainty. Um, Absolutely. You know, I even look even at the stock market. I'm like, what the heck? I mean, like, I don't really trust it. I'm like, I'm delighted when I look at my stock portfolio, <laughs> yep, but I don't yep. really trust it. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Hmm, yeah. Why do I move everything to cash or, you know, right. Right. Uh, you know, some counter cyclical stuff. It's, it's, uh, I think we're living in a world of higher uncertainty. So great results, but great uncertainty. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's interesting. So you talk about, you know, you're concerned about the supply chain and, and certainly we've seen with this resurgence and concern about the Delta variant of COVID, we've seen recent um, shutdowns at ports in, uh, yep. in China. 
how are you guys managing it? What strategies do you employ? What are you seeing? And, and how do you just really tackle that for yourself and for your customers, et cetera? This is sort of where the, um, uh, the balance of being a risk taker and also being a pragmatist come in. Sure. Um, there's a certain amount of um, knowing that it's gonna take longer to get goods Mm -hmm. to my customers than it used to, to get them even to my warehouse to have as sort of backup and and safety stock. Um, And so we are extending our buying cycle on our side and pre-buying a lot of products. The risky part of that is that it does leave you in a position to be holding high priced inventory at a time when you don't want to. Um, But in my mind, I would rather be in a situation where I took care of that customer um, than not. And, and mm. all of business is a, is a risk calculation. There are people in this industry right now who are saying, I'm just getting out. I'm sorry. I cannot serve you. I cannot provide that product because the risk of, you know, buying something 12 weeks before you need it, nine weeks before you need it is too great. And I don't blame them one bit. I've, I've wrestled with that, but we are taking a position that we are going to stick with these customers and let them rely on us in the long term. And so we've really put our, our energy behind that. In addition, I, I did mention, you know, we have a lot of um, longstanding relationships, um, you know, just um, obviously we have contracts with, with ocean carriers and things like that. Um, and our suppliers are just outstanding. I mean, they're they're great companies, they make great products and they're great people. And so That's we've great. really leaned hard into to working on how we can manage the logistics. But um, we are we work the solution at TRI, we do not work the problem. And so we've just decided that we're gonna, the, the, there is a lot of noise about what's going on, but at the end of the day, you cannot sell what you don't have and we're gonna get it here. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good. Um, so I don't see Seattle as a chemical hub. <laughs> um, I, when I think about chemicals in Seattle, I'm thinking, you know, anywhere along the West coast, like, do they really want you there? Um, yeah. can you actually attract employees? Do they want to be part of chemical companies? So tell, tell me about doing business in Seattle as a chemical yeah. distributor. I mean, is it easy? Is it hard? Mm-hmm. Um, we we were founded in Seattle because, like I, I think I mentioned, that um, when Tony left West Point, it was to um, come out to uh, JBLM Joint Base Lewis McCord out here, and he served as an officer there. And um, so this is where he had landed by military posting, and and sure. it's hard not to fall in love with this place. And so um, he, he set up shop here and truthfully, Seattle is a great place to be. If you are um, somebody who runs an international business, like Mm -hmm. we do, Um, our customers are all over the United States. And so we didn't feel like, um, and we've never felt like we've been at any disadvantage. Um, We, we have to, you know, warehouse and move things near them regardless. So it didn't exactly matter where the locus of operations was for us. Um, I will say that, you know, the, there are challenges, I think, at a regulatory and governmental level um, in any state that you go and, and the yeah. state of Washington at times um, presents and, and sort of the, just at, at a public policy level, I think sometimes it can feel um, difficult, whether your business is chemical distribution or, or something else. I mean, I think if you if you study businesses in Washington, some of them are, you know, love it. And some of them kind of feel hamstrung by that. So we're, we're definitely susceptible to all the same things. But it really does make sense for us. Um, the, the biggest challenge I would say is sometimes it's harder to be three hours behind the East coast. You, yeah. Like I cannot overstate sort of the impact of that. Um, but, but, you know, really it's, it's not too bad. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's good. And I think, you know, the whole time zone challenge. Um, yeah. I mean, heck I've worked global businesses my whole career, you know, so yeah. at some point you just get used to saying, Oh yeah, I'm taking a 6 a.m. phone call, or I'm taking a phone yep. call at 10 p.m. and uh, and I and 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 you just kind of live with it. Um, and I, you know, on the flip side, when I, you know, when I'm working in Europe, um, and I'm just waiting for the U.S. to wake up. Could you guys wake up? I've got a phone call. I've got a question. Yep. You know, but 
you figure out how to work around it. And same thing with the whole East coast, West coast dynamic. And then of course, as yep. you point out, if you're, uh, if you're working as an international company and, um, a lot of your suppliers coming from Asia and stuff, there's probably benefits. Um, true. And it's also kind of nice to be ne- unique, I guess, sometimes in your it is. space. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. So, so, you know, one of the things I've been talking with folks about a lot is just some of these key trends that we certainly see going on in the chemical industry. So sustainability and circularity is accelerating, right? So the focus on that is absolutely accelerating. Um, Digitization, people are making leapfrog movements in that space. How are you guys approaching either one of those? Are, are they important to you and your customers and your business, or are they kind of secondary? They're important. Um, and I, I think that I don't have a criticism of the industry here, but I do think we could do a better job of, of sort of explaining um, that in a lot of ways, the chemical industry is at the forefront of sustainability and has been for a lot longer than anybody was talking about it. Yeah. And so now it has become a hot topic, but I'm not necessarily sure that it's new for us. Right. Um, I think if you uh, know any chemical distributors or chemical manufacturers, some of the waste removal, treatment, um, reduction, recycling, um, the amount of materials in this industry that are sold as a as a byproduct or um, off spec or, or just not sent to any sort of waste and are, are again, turned back into sort of the the chain of commerce in this country. It's amazing. And I think, um, and we do that with uh, statistically low incidents. I I say statistically because I don't mean to diminish when something happens, but I think people fail to understand like that that is, that's the numerator you're seeing. There is a denominator of things that are going right. And so we maybe don't um, talk enough about the denominator. So Mm -hmm. we've always participated in, um, we are certified by the NECD's Responsible Distribution Program. We take great care to ensure that our products move and are delivered in a way that honors all uh, environmental efforts and sustainability efforts in, uh, that are you know, put forth by the government and frankly, which exceed that which the you know, pertinent agencies suggest. Um, we take that seriously. I I always want to remind people that chemistry travels in the communities that we live in too. So I I never forget that it matters what we do with our products and it matters if people's, you know, water and all of that are, are treated right. I will also say that um, when it comes to uh, digitization and things like that, I think this industry, like any other uh, can be improved by some of the technology that's coming about making certain parts of our jobs easier. I think it's great to be able to have access to needed information about products. I think it makes it easier for customers if they can um, you know, speed up their ordering pattern. I do also think that this is one of those industries where at the end of the day, two people getting on a phone together or being in a room together uh, is a little bit required. And so I yeah. don't know how that dance will end up, um, but you know, I just look at our experience. Most of our chemicals are sold to people uh, who are chemists <laughs> and then a purchasing agent, you know, accelerates that process. But, um, but at the end of the day, this is chemistry and the, and the reaction has to work. Yeah, that's, a, I think that's a great point. And I think it's, um, I don't think we'll ever really get away from the fact that be, because many of these products have to, you know, they have a lot of um, safety and handling requirements. They yes. need to be effective in use there's always going to be a large degree of personalization and personal relationship and confirming that um, it, that your customer has the handling requirements appropriate and that the product's going to work in use and all that. Um, but I yep. think along the way, there's a lot of um, digital, digital streamlining that can take place, right? I mean, I think yep. one of the things I always come back to is the fact that as individuals, so many of us just, I mean, we live on our phones. Right. Yeah. We have this expectation of I can track my Amazon package every moment yeah. of every day and see where it is on the truck. Um, and we somehow need to make sure we're translating this to the people in our mm-hmm. chemical businesses that we're yeah. that we're doing with. And, and it's um, it's not easy because I also think no. there's not clear return on investment. And that's maybe one of the biggest challenges is figuring out 
is there a return on investment? What is it? And, uh, and to your, you know, earlier point, sometimes it's a leap of faith, right? I've certainly yeah. seen that, yep. um, in, uh, when I was at shell in some of the investments that we made that we had no idea yeah. what they were actually going to do three years down the road. You're like, Oh, well, we're able to do a, B and C because yep. we made this investment that we couldn't figure out exactly whether it was a good investment or not, yes. um, but it was the right digital investment. So it's, yep. um, yeah, it's, it's a hard, it's, I think this is a, a moving, uh, a moving target for all of us. The other thing, you know, I'm going to come back around to sustainability and I think you're right in, in also in the sense that the chemical industry needs to own the narrative a whole lot better, right? So we've Absolutely. been sustainable for a long time. Um, so many of the value added products came from a ref- uh, um, off stream, right? So there's circularity as it relates to refineries and chemical plants, et cetera. And so we don't, we haven't owned the narrative very well. We haven't explained it very well. We just kind of say, well, this is what we do and, and have, there's a certain amount of expectation. The other thing I observe is Western companies. So, uh, us, Canada, Europe, probably, you know, uh, Mexico to a larger degree have much better environmental profiles, right? So when I, when we see what's going on, um, even like plastics, right? So it's, you know, my kids show me video of, Oh, you know, there's all this plastics in the ocean. Like, okay, yes, this is a problem. And it's a problem that's not originating from you and I, it's a problem that's originating in China or India or elsewhere. And how do you reconcile this? Obviously, you've said that a lot of your supply comes from overseas, which uh-huh. and it's coming from Asia, which maybe has some different standards. How do you reconcile this for yeah. yourself, for your customers or with your suppliers? We, um, first of all, there, I think it's important to note that um, even within, you know, any global company, you know, in the U.S., there are chemical manufacturers that are at the top line and you want to do business with them. And there are some that um, aren't doing it right. And I think that's here and that's everywhere. Yeah. The companies that we do business with overseas are in many ways um, setting the pace for us to follow in terms of their sustainability efforts and their, um, you know, sort of commitment to the environment and um, sort of being at the forefront of some of that technology. We work with some companies that are just highly reputable and hold themselves to high standards. And I think um, many of them, uh, in, a, in a strange way, many of them have seen this coming maybe before we did. I think mm. in some places, if you are not necessarily a um, highly regulated industry, but you sense that that could come. Many of them have made those advancements in technology and done it before they were required to. So I, I do think um, that everybody will go to the standard that we hold them to. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And in the U.S., sure. if, if you are a responsible buyer, and at the end of the day, I, I am in some yeah. sense, um, I want to know that I'm doing business with companies overseas that get it and that are doing that. And so we ask those questions and we put those things in front of them. I have customers that want to know what, tell me about the supply chain of the products Mm -hmm. that you've provided, um, not just for you, Meg, but for your supplier. And so I think that what has happened over time is that because the customers are asking, because we're asking, because we're responsible distributors, they've, um, they've gotten there in a lot of ways first. It would just, just sort of surprise start me. elevating. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. If they weren't beforehand. So I think um, there's a lot of great companies overseas that are seeing that. And I think that it's great because they're going to be the thought leaders for their entire continent for how to improve and, and how to clean that up. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. Yeah. Awesome. That's helpful. So let's, um, I'm going to turn this a little bit, but just back to you. Tell me, sure. um, you know, I think one of the things people are always interested in is just kind of, you know, your leadership, what's your leadership style or your mantra when you think about, um, you know, running your, your company? Um, that'd probably be a question for the people who work for me. <laughs> <laughs> we can go back and ask them if need be. <laughs> I, you know, to be honest, I think, um, people would describe me as a pretty, um, I'm pretty down to earth. And I tend to be a person, I don't usually do a whole lot of asking for things that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. And um, I believe that the most successful companies are the companies that are led by people with good character 
So I try to have good character and I try to model exactly what I expect. Um, I also have a lot of faith in the people that work for me and I don't have anyone working for me that I don't have faith in. And um, so that means being very slow to hire at times um, and a little quicker to to end the relationship if it's not working out. I want people working here that I can trust and that don't require micromanagement. And that frankly would be the kind of people that would bristle under such, you know, such methods. I don't wanna have to do that. And I, I think um, to the extent that you have people that are excited about what they're doing and, and talented and don't require a lot of that, I don't do that. But I'm a pretty, um, what you see is what you get kind of, kind of lady. And I'm known for being um, very plain and direct in what I think about a situation. Um, and I don't really have a temper, but I think people will tell you that, um, that they know when I'm serious. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Yeah. That's, that's good. So tell me what's next for, um, for TRI. Growth, okay. always growth. Yeah. I think um, continue to do what we do well and do more of it. Um, and I'm- Are you looking for organic growth? Are you looking for some inorganic growth? Do we- Both. You know, now that, yeah, okay. Both, yeah. I think we would um, be open to and, and would explore um, all kinds of growth. I am a person that um, likes the next challenge. I am- always excited about what we can build. And I like building things. I like building businesses. I liked that part of my law career, helping people start and build their businesses and figure out their way out of uh, tricky situations. So I can't imagine a situation where I will ever be on coast around here. Um, and so we're just going to keep doing that. I'm open to creative things. And uh, yeah, I think some of it will be organic. And I think there is a place for some in- inorganic uh, acquisition seeking awesome. kind of moves to. Awesome. Great. Well, I, um, I'm looking to forward to see what happens coming thank uh, you. You know, coming soon. Right. Yes. So, Meg, thank you so much. I have really enjoyed speaking with you today and I know, uh, my listeners are going to love hearing from you and hearing your perspectives. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Awesome. And thanks everybody for listening to the chemical show until next time. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.